From December 1943 until January 1945, Milan Central Train Station served as the principal deportation center for the Jews of Northern Italy during the Holocaust. Over the course of this 14-month period, 15 convoys operated by the Reich Main Security Office departed from Milano Centrale Station. The majority of these convoys, 11 in number, terminated at Auschwitz. The first two went there directly, while others stopped first at an Italian concentration camp, usually Fossoli or Bolzano, before departing for Auschwitz at a later date. The remainder of the convoys terminated not at Auschwitz, but at Bergen-Belsen, Ravensbrück, or Flossenburg, either arriving there directly or after first stopping in Bolzano. And here I should note that although the focus of my research is the Jewish victims, political enemies of the state were also deported from Milano Centrale Station. At the end of the war, only a very small number of the victims deported, victims who were both Italian and foreign, returned. As an illustrative case, from the deportation of January 30th, 1944, the largest deportation of Jews from Milan during the Holocaust, only 20 of the 605 victims survived. Upon returning to Italy, many longed to share their experiences, but often found that their stories fell on deaf ears. Consequently, most survivors retracted into silence although it should be noted that for many, the silence was self-imposed from the beginning. So what we can say is that the memoirists of this group, the Primo Levis, the Emilio Yanis, they were not representative of this community of survivors. It was not until the later 20th century that survivors in Italy began bearing witness to the Holocaust in earnest. This was facilitated in large part by the Centro di Documentazione Ebraica Contemporanea, CEDEC, which began to conduct interviews with survivors in the 1980s. For many of these survivors, their stories converged in Milan. Some, like Liliana Segre and Fausta Finzi, were Milanese from birth. Others had come to Milan only later in life for reasons but unrelated to the Second World War. For example, Lina Ventore Yafe was born in Turkey, spent much of her child in Johannesburg, returned to Turkey during World War I, briefly lived in Egypt afterward, and then shuffled between Milan and Paris before settling on Milan because she liked Italy most of all and because much of her family was already there. And yet still others arrived to Milan for the first time only under compulsion. Isacco Bayona had been born in Greece to a Greco-Italian family. After Italy declared war on Greece, he was deported to Italy where his family settled in Livorno. During the bombardments, they relocated to the countryside around Livorno, where they were arrested by Italians in Gabro. After detainment in Gabro, Livorno, and Florence, he and his family were taken to Milan, where they, like so many others, were detained in San Vittore prison before deportation. Though their origins differ, the biographies of these victims converge on their deportations. After detainment in San Vittore prison, all were expelled from Milan, from Milano Centrale Station. Their memories of the station are not uniform, but they are always unpleasant. Segre remembers the palpable, tangible, physical violence that the SS guards inflicted upon the deportees while loading them onto livestock wagons. She also recalls their Italian accomplices, the Repubblichini, looking on approvingly. Other survivors do not discuss physical violence per se, but they join Segre <coughs> in describing the discomfort and the dehumanization they felt as they were crammed into boxcars and deprived of basic human necessities, unaware of the fates that awaited them. 
Survivors also recalled the profound darkness at the station as they were unloaded from lorries and reloaded onto wagons. When the victims arrived at Milano Centrale, they were not taken to the usual reception area for passengers. Their lorries passed by the monumental structure that had been built to impress the world, Ulisse Stacchini's travertine and marble monument, signaling the revitalization of Italy under fascism. Instead, the victims were unloaded in a concealed location beneath the primary railway tracks, in a space typically used for mail and merchandise. And that space can be seen here in the red oval. And in particular, you want to pay attention to the exact center of this oval, just beyond the canopies of the station, because this is where a series of montavagoni, or wagon lifts, wagon elevators, were located. I'll discuss this more in a moment, but basically, this is where things, mail, merchandise, were loaded beneath the main levels in this hidden space, and then they were elevated to the main levels one by one, where, after so many were established, they were assembled into a train and then sent wherever they were going. Also can be seen in this image, just to the, to the right of, of the Red Oval, is the new post office that was also opened in 1931, also designed by Stacchini as part of this new station complex. It was connected to the station via a tunnel that passed beneath via Ferrante a Porti, indicated here. So in this hidden space beneath the station, unknown to most and unseen by all, the victims were loaded and locked into boxcars, and there they waited in the dark, usually for hours on end, before being lifted to the surface and expelled from Milan. Today, the Show Memorial of Milan is situated on the precise site from which the deportations took place, in the bowels of Milano Centrale Station. And here you can see it's located at precisely the end of the canopies. According to Michaela Bassanelli, the idea to build a show memorial of Milan first took root in 2003. Through the efforts of organizations like CEDEC, the Associazione Fili della Shoah, the Comunità Ebraica di Milano, and the Catholic Comunità di Sant'Egidio, the memorial's promoters exhumed the abandoned space beneath the station. In 2006, President Giorgio Napolitano publicly endorsed the reopening of this space to the public. And two years later, the Ferrovie dello Stato Italiane, another of the memorial's founding bodies, officially handed over the memorial space to the Fondazione Memoriale della Shoah di Milano. Ten years after its conception, the Show Memorial of Milan was inaugurated in 2013 on the Holocaust Day of Memory, January 27th. The memorial that stands today is the work of architects Guido Morporgo and Annalisa de Cortes. Guided by Primo Levi's principle that to comprehend is almost to justify, the architects tried to avoid building any explicit commentaries into the memorial. It was more important that they excavate the space, fashion it into a memorial, and then let this un unearthed palimpsest speak for itself. But this is not to say that the architects do not have their own convictions. As Morporgo has explained in no uncertain terms, the hidden remains were not just an abandoned neutral space, but a reminder of a troubling past that Italians intentionally suppressed, a past that began with the anti-Semitic racial laws in 1938 and continued with Italians' collaboration in the Holocaust deportations. As mentioned, one example of the hidden remains is here, the Montevagoni. I'm not sure if you can read, but in the top right photo, it says that the transportation of humans via these Montevagoni was expressly prohibited. It was for male material objects only. But during the Holocaust, it was repurposed for just that motive. Also, I think it can be said that the memorial does have its own mission. One of its slogans, after all, is 
Un luogo per ricordarsi di ricordare. I will leave it to the translator to give the most accurate translation of that. In particular at the memorial, the place of reflection, the final site on the walk through the commemorative space, was built to provide an opportunity for visitors to contemplate the importance of socio-cultural and political responsibility and the consequences of collective forgetting. In Morporgo's words, through the critical interpretation of the document monument, which is the memorial space, the place of reflection reaffirms through architecture a principle of responsibility and the ethical dimension of memory. Ultimately, the architects attest that the memorial is built as a place of experience. It is the visitor's obligation to find meaning therein. As a visitor, and also as a student of history, one overpowering narrative that I read in the memorial is the narrative of indifference. For students and scholars of the Holocaust around the world, the figure most closely associated with the concept of indifference is probably Elie Wiesel. In Italy, however, the first name that likely comes to mind is Liliana Segre, that is, Senator for Life, Liliana Segre. Throughout the memorial's conception and construction, the architects and survivors remained in close collaboration, often even routinely visiting the site together. The architects could not execute the survivors' every wish or request, but one idea that they did include was indifference. Indifference, Segre insists, kills more than violence, and she identifies it as the quintessential factor enabling something like the Holocaust to occur. Her request fulfilled, visitors to the memorial are immediately met with a literal wall of indifference, an imposing gray wall built of reinforced concrete like the structure that surrounds it. For the community of Holocaust survivors, indifference has remained a central, mostly insurmountable problem in their struggles to process their experiences. Indifference has thus become a prominent collective memory of the Holocaust for survivors, including survivors in Italy. To the victims in Italy of anti-Semitic racism beginning in 1938 and Nazi fascist genocide from 1943 to 1945, their experiences of discrimination, persecution, deportation, and extermination challenge the dominant master narratives used to often describe Italian history under fascism and Nazi fascism. It is my contention that when squared against the hegemonic narratives of fascism, World War II, and the Holocaust that have prevailed in Italy at different times, by which I might say these are universal resistance, collective victimhood, moral superiority vis-a-vis -vis Nazi Germany, and Italiani brava gente, when squared against this collection of hegemonic narratives, the collective counter-memory of indifference, given concrete expression at the Shoah Memorial of Milan, establishes Milano Centrale Station as a site of memory contestation in Italy. If we establish, then, that the collective memory for survivors articulated at the Shoah Memorial of Milan is indifference, a general indifference to their fates, then what might this indifference have looked like? Echoing Primo Levi, Segre says that with the passing of the racial laws in 1938, we were suddenly thrown into the gray zone of indifference. Gray zone is an inherently and intentionally ambiguous concept that contains the vast ch chasm of possibility between perpetrator and victim. For this reason, gray zone could account for any number of behaviors or dispositions on the part of the general population. The gray zone could be used to describe how Segre and Gotti Herskovitz Bauer felt when the racial laws barred them from receiving a public education and their former classmates began to distance themselves. The gray zone could also characterize the Herskovitz family status in Fiume, where Jews were disadvantaged for reasons of language and geography, but where their family nevertheless enjoyed the generous solidarity of their neighbors. Perhaps the gray zone blackened at times, like when the mascalzoni, or scoundrels, who smuggled Gotti and her mother to the Swiss border, betrayed them to Italian border guards before they could cross. Or sometimes maybe the gray zone simply remained gray, like when the Milanese, as Segre recalls, 
stayed hidden behind their windows the morning of January 30th, 1944, while she, her father, and over 600 other Jews were transported from San Vittore prison to Milano Centrale Station. In the post-war period, this nebulous experiential fog refused to evaporate. Fausta Finzi recalls finding no solidarity from other Italians. And Segre remembers the general Italian population looking upon Holocaust survivors as a social nuisance. Herskovitz Bauer emerged from Auschwitz and tried to share her story far and wide. But she stopped testifying altogether when she began to detect a tiredness, a stanchezza, in her increasingly begrudging audience. All Italians had been victimized by the war, so the story went, and more pressing matters required their attention, like recovering from the bombardments. Perhaps today the specter of indifference still exists. For instance, in prominent political figures who, on the occasion of the Shoah Memorial of Milan's inauguration, claimed that, apart from the racial laws, Mussolini did well. Given the strong cautionary tale contained in the word, individuals and groups involved with the memorial cite indifference as their watchword. As of this summer, the memorial was hosting a temporary exhibit on displaced European Jews who sought safe passage to Palestine after World War II, when Italy functioned as the port of Zion for Europe. It is no stretch of the imagination to interpret this as a commentary on the immigration crises of today. Also periodically since 2015, the Memorial Foundation and the Comunità di Sant'Egidio have opened the memorial's doors to refugees from Africa and from the Middle East. Refugees receive overnight accommodations, meals, hygienic services, and shelter as they await the next leg of their journey to Northern Europe. The organizers of such initiatives are clearly aware of the humanitarian exigencies of the day and the ethical demands of the memorial. As Odorico Maggi, member of the Comunità di Sant'Egidio, explains, this place has a very strong historical charge. Add Stefano Pasta, in words that ring true on my side of the Atlantic, Europe at this time is split between walls and barbed wire on one side and hospitality on the other. Those who have pledged themselves here at the memorial have decided to stand on the side of solidarity. They are led by the simple principle to not be indifferent. As Roberto Yarak, president of the Memorial Foundation, indicates, the writing at the entrance has guided us. At a time when many Italians are embracing nationalist, populist, and xenophobic political platforms, the warning against indifference is as pertinent as ever. However, the show Memorial of Milan, the show Memorial of Milan remains unfinished. The memorial was never intended to comprise only the commemorative space. The workshop of memory, which will include an archive and library space that will house the contents of Chidek, is just as integral. And pictured here is an artist rendering of the library and the reading room, and as you can see, how it stands as of July 2018. Here in the workshop of memory, as envisioned by the memorial's developers, a new collective memory for the future will take shape. A collective memory forged through cross-cultural research and debate that will be civil, critical, and aware in nature. But in a commonly heard refrain, a lack of funds has stalled the memorial's completion, and the archive and library space remains a shell. Although the history being created in the bowels of Milano Centrale today is praiseworthy, necessary, and markedly different from that of the early 1940s, the memorial will not be able to fulfill its own mandate until this research center opens. Thank you.